today my topic will be uh, big data in finance. Uh, so it's a very challenging topic. Uh, because finally I realized I need to talk about something which does not have a clear definition. Okay, so the, for the sake of this talk, I want to define a big data in three dimensions. First one is like, if we think about big data, it needs to be large size. That's a minimum, right? But only size is not enough. Usually big data also have high dimension. So what does high dimension mean? High dimension means like you have lots, lots of variables. Sometimes the number of variables can even be bigger than the number of observations. This is called a high dimensional problem. And the third dimension is complex structure. So since I was a student, uh, even now, uh, most time I work with panel data. It's like raw column flat format. But there are lots of data are unstructured. So for example, it's like satellite image, social media, credit card transactions. And today we are taking a video. That's the unstructured data. So we are creating the data in this process. Okay. So uh, here is the roadmap of my talk. So I will start from large size. And that, then I will move to high dimension. Then complex structure. But I want to really add one thing. So I hope you guys uh, will not think about it's like a big data is a collection of empirical facts. So later I want to show you, I, I will try to convince you, big data also motivate new economic theories. Okay, so let's start with large size. Okay, so uh, the first question is like, uh, we, why we have smaller data set? Okay, some data sets are naturally are small. But some others data sets are small, it's because we have some selection process to reduce the size of the data. Okay, for example, we can have smaller sample size. And sometimes we have less variable. We can collect more variables, but we collect fewer variables. And sometimes we aggregate the economic activity. And sometimes we take snapshots. All these things reduce the size of data. It creates data we can manage, right? But there's a natural question to ask, are there any selection bias when we create smaller data? So I want to show you one example. So this is a New York Stock Exchange trade and quote data, okay? Uh, it's a small data set. I want to use that as an example as a small data set. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, seriously, it's a small data set compared to another one. So it includes all trades and quotes reported to the consolidated tape. So it's 25 gigabytes, but that's per day. So why is this a small data set? Because there's an even larger data set than tech. Because think about, if you submit orders, sometimes you cancel orders. Some order remain unexecuted. It's in the order level data, but not in the trader level data. So this is an order level data, one of the order level data uh, from NASDAQ. So basically it tells you when people add order, when people cancel order. Okay, so technically, we want to ask a question. Are there any selection buyers in tech data? So, it's something we try to compare large data set with a larger data set. Okay, so what do we find? Uh, before I say what do we find, uh, it's uh, very data intensive. Okay, so then I find exceed. Okay, so we use high performance computing, I mean, to basically to make this one work. Why it works? Because majority of data we, we work with is still a panel data, right? There are two levels of natural parallels. The first one is day by day. You can uh, do the first parallelization at day by day. So it will reduce the data size to about uh, 100 gigabytes per day. It's still large if you want to do some manipulations. So the second parallel is across the stocks. Across stocks is a little bit tricky because some stocks like Apple, they trade so much. It's equivalent to like 500 small stocks. So if we want like 7,000 parallels, that's a waste of resources. So what do we do is something simple. We just uh, parallelize based on the sample size. Okay, so what do we find? We find actually tech data have selection bias. And this selection bias was created by regulation. Why? Because in the past, if you trade less than 100 shares, you don't need to report. Why? Because think about that. It's like people most times think like a small traders come from small traders. For example, my neighbor buy one share of Disney for his kid. Is that interesting? Should that be regulated? Probably no. But when we compare the large data set and the larger data set, we finally realize all the lots actually are missing. Trades less than 100 shares. So lots of people told me it's like a tech data include all the trades. Before 2013, that's not true. Small trades disappear. 
But is that a big deal? It's a big deal. 25% of observations is truncated. Especially for high price stocks, some well-known stock. Google is like a majority of observations are truncated, 53%. For Apple, it's 38%. Okay, it's a huge truncation, but why is this truncation? Are these coming from retail traders? You can look at this pattern. So this is a series of 111 trades. Each one of them is unreported. Okay, but everything happened within one millisecond. So we, find, uh, we pick a smaller sample from NASDAQ, 120 stocks. But can retail traders do that? I don't know whether you can do that. I cannot do that. Trade 111 times in one millisecond. Okay. So finally we realize, here's one thing we find, is machines challenge existing regulations. We find that these trades are more likely to come from a computer. Why do they do that? Because if you have a large order, let's say you want to trade a million shares, okay, you can slice and dice your orders into many, many pieces. Each one of them is not reported. Why do you want to do that? You try to hide the information, right? This is surprising. It's like all the lots are most informed trades. Actually, anything below 100, they are most informative. It's like they are informed guys who slice and dice orders. So basically, it's a, it's a truncation caused by regulation, and then people's behavior change. Uh, if you have supervised computers, you can send lots of small trades to the market, and nobody using consoled tape is able to see you. So this one actually has policy impact. Finally, regulators uh, see our paper, then they reduce the threshold to one share. Okay. Then the question is like, the regulation change, where this cutoff affects the results before, even before computers. Finally realize, sometimes it can have tiny, tiny truncations, but when it's combined with other truncations, it can be a big deal. Why? Because uh, there's a difficulty to find a, a long time series of retail traders. There's Terrace or Dean's data, but if you want a really long time series, you need to find some proxy. And the best proxy, uh, proxy is uh, one designed by Charles Lee and his co-authors. It's like, let's say, many, many years ago, it's like, still, small trades are more likely to come from small traders. Let's set a cutoff, let's say $5,000. Okay, that's the best uh, we can did, uh, we did, like many. Uh, many, many years ago. But finally, when we realize uh, the 100 shares cut off, we realize when you combine two truncations, that causes problem. Why? Because think about it. If you have a stock with price above 50, the minimum trade size is 100. What's the conclusion? You will say retail traders don't trade these stocks. Right? And this is a truncation based directly on price. It does not even depend. The market share of all lots, because this, this is a new truncating rule. It's like, okay, any stock with price above 50 is truncated. So how big is the issue? If you look at, this is the number of stocks truncated. It seems like not a big deal. It's like a, about 10%, okay? But think about it. Most high price stocks are very large stocks. Think about Google, right? And also, this is a pattern fluctuates with business cycle, right? If you look at here, so this is dot-com bubble period. There are lots, lots of higher price stocks at that point, right? So if you do this $5,000 cutoff, you will find about 70% of market cap is truncated, right? And you can make a conclusion. It's like if you use that as an example of retail trades, you said retail trades do not trade dot-com stocks in tech bubble period. So it's a mechanical pattern, right? So here is like, I just, just uh, want to use this paper as an example uh, to motivate you to think about two things. Number one is techniques. Techniques I want to say like exceed helps to solve the size challenge. But I want to talk slightly more broadly about two economic intuitions. Number one is like, there's open questions for public policy. Because existing regulations are designed for humans. Machine learning and big data actually bring machine players into the market. So should we update some or revise some regulation used to design for humans, for machines? This is one question. And the second question is like, are there sample selection bias in any other small data sets we know? 
It's possible, but I think it will be very interesting question where we can collect more data or large size data. Maybe some of the conclusions we draw from previous literature can change. So next I want to talk about high dimension. Okay, so there are large number of variables relative to the sample size. So let's start from a motivating example. So, I mean, big data and machine learning are two buzzwords in the Wall Street. Uh, there are lots of famous firms, like, let's say Renaissance Technologies and Wall Street Journal says, okay, they use machine learning techniques to make investment decision, and their horizon ranging from a few minutes to a few months. Okay, then the question is, okay, Let's think about the farthest guy in this spectrum, minute by minute guys. Do they track any economic meaningful signal? Okay, so here we met a high dimensional challenge at a minute by minute horizon. So the basic idea is like, okay, let's uh, start with a simple example. You can use lag return of other stocks to predict the return of the city, okay? Uh, let's say other stocks, the universe is New York Stock Exchange listed stocks. So they are about uh, like 2,000 of them. Okay, each minute you get one observation. If you run ORS regression, you need 2,000 observations. So that's six trading days. There are too many right-hand side variables to make the prediction. So you technically, you cannot run ORS regression, especially when the signal are short-lived. So how to solve this issue? Machine learning techniques, okay. So I will not go deep into machine learning techniques, but I just want to summarize about the differences in approach. So traditional approach is like a, we use economic reasoning to select a predictor, let's call it X. Okay, and then we use statistics to estimate whether X is a good estimator. We can do sorting, we can run linear regression. So machine learning, it's different, it's like they use like statistic method to both select and estimate X. So it can handle a large number of X, and sometimes it has more flexible functional form. Okay, so let me summarize machine learning techniques also using one slide is, okay, there are two common features of machine learning techniques. Number one is they focus more on like out of sample pr uh, predictions. So this is something called cross validation. So the goal is to maximize out of sample predictions. So they focus less emphasis on the causal inference. That's number one feature. Number two is like uh, they impose regularization. What is that? It's penalty for complex models, okay? And there are two variations about different types of machine learning techniques. Number one is functional form, okay? You can have linear functional form, you can have regression trees, or you can have neural networks. And the second dimension is the type of regularization you have, okay? So then I use uh, one of my paper with Alex Chinko. Uh, what we do is like we use Lasso, okay? So, What's the functional form of Lasso? It's a linear functional form, okay? It's like an OLS, so we try to minimize this term. But why Lasso is different? Lasso's difference is like there's some penalty term. So the penalty was imposed on beta, okay? So the main idea is how can Lasso do variable selection? So first we need to normalize the variable uh, before regression, and if you have small beta, Lasso set that to zero. If you have large beta, Lasso basically shrink that. So that means uh, if you have a beta which is too small, then Lasso ignore this predictor. Okay. And next is what is cross validation? It's like we use standard like tenfold cross validation. What does it do? Because in the previous regression, there is one free parameter which is lambda, which is a penetrate term, right? If we set lambda equal to zero, that's ORS, right? If we set a ridiculous large lambda, we get nothing. Okay, and then how to pick lambda? So here's what we do. It's like we divided the sample into 10 chunks. We call 90% of them as training sample. And the other 10% is called testing sample. So we use the training sample, 90% to calculate the Lasso estimator. And then we use the testing sample to calculate the mean square error. And this is the term. It depends on K, also it depends on lambda. And then we repeat step two to three, 10 times to get the average. And then we pick the number with the best like overall performance. There's, there can be some twists, but the basic idea is like we try to find an optimal number. Okay, so what do we find? We find lasso implied strategy work really well. 
Singapore Sharpe ratio during our sample period is 2005 to 2012. So the Sharpe ratio of SP500 is 0 0.123. But the Sharpe ratio of lasso implied strategy, okay, is about 1.8. And we have alpha of 2.8, okay. So if we're on a hedge fund, that's the last slide, okay. But we are writing papers. We need to find, again, the most important thing to, it's like a, we are economics, we are academics. So we try to find an economic interpretation of this result. So then uh, Alex, Adam, and I actually established four results. So number one is like it's unexpected because there's many, many like well-known factors, small stocks, uh, large stocks predict small stocks, some, some kind of a long-term relationship, like a weekly or monthly. We find it does not work well at short horizon. Why? It's related to the numda. We find the numda, um, it's like a, at least lasso typically ignore any predictor weaker than 2.5 per month. So many weekly or monthly predictor cannot generate this high return. But then the other question is, okay, will you have a ridiculous high return? Will I become super rich? Something like that? Uh, no, the answer is there's a trade-off. 95% of lasso predictors we pick at minute min, by minute horizon disappear within 14.2 minutes. And it's also sparse. Lasso use only 12.7 predictors on average. And this is the most significant result. It's like, and also surprising, it's like, we find Lasso are more likely to pick a stock as a predictor before, again, it's before this stock have a news announcement, even if we pick the best news announcement, the feedback, uh, uh, data feeds. So then the question is, is that an insider trading? Here's finally we figure out what happens. It's like big data in corporate information faster than news announcement. So sometimes when we talk about public information, we use news as an example of public information, but think about who writes the news. Sometimes a machine can write the news, but you need a news reporter to write some story, right? It takes time. So here I want to pick one example. Actually, it's a story with Tobin. So we invite you for a seminar, but you arrive late. I remember you come to the seminar room and say that you apologize because your train hit a truck. <laughs> and then we Google the news. We didn't find any news, unfortunately. <laughs> Later, once you arrive, you send us an email. You tell us, here is the news. So basically, your idea is like it's unscheduled news. You saw the news, reporter come later. So then there's a lag. Finally, you realize, oh, actually, what Tobin met is something called unscheduled news. It takes a reporter sometimes to write a new story. So then we did another empirical test. This is one of the main results. It's like, okay, if you have scheduled news, Lasso will pick that in the same minute. If it's unscheduled news, then you see Lasso pick the stock as a predictor, more likely to see Lasso pick the stock as a predictor first, and then you see the news. So here is my interpretation. It's like something happened. Some guys may be on site or something, uh, they, they can trade. And the machine learning recognizes this pattern, and the machine learning follows this pattern, and later news comes. So that's the economic interpretation. And then let me move slightly broader. Even in terms of trading, there are at least three open questions along three lines. Number one is like, a, Alex and I, we started minute by minute horizon, but you can apply Lasso to other horizons. There have already been three nice papers on monthly horizon. But again, there's a huge spectrum between one minute to one month. What kind of economic signal does Lasso, if any, they capture? This is what I call other horizon. The other dimension is other regularizations. So Kozak, Nigo, and Santosh have a nice paper using rigid regression. So what is rigid regression? It's, again, linear functional form. What's the difference? It's the penalty term. It's the square of beta. So Lasso using absolute value of beta. And uh, the third dimension is like, do you have other functional forms? So uh, Gu, Kelly, and Shu has uh, a paper showing this like, okay, other functional forms, for example, your regression tree, neural networks can capture important non-linear realities and interactions. So later I want to have a titanic example. It's not in finance, but it's, it's an example I really like. So Harold Varen has a paper. So basically, here's the problem. You try to predict the survival rate of people in Titanic. You can run a logistic regression. What's the result? Re result, age doesn't matter. 
But then you have another philosophy. Then uh, he ran another regression using regression trees. Regression tree is highly nonlinear. Basically, it's a split into different nodes. And then the main result, he finds it's like, okay, if you are less than 8.5 years old, you are much more likely to survive. Beyond that, the pattern becomes much more complex. So then the economic intuition is, it's a children first. This matches the economic reality. We know the reality, but if you only have the data, you look at the pattern, you find it, you find this rule, children first. Okay, so what's the main takeaway from high dimension? Techniques, we have already have machine learning techniques to deal with high dimensional data, but I think uh, it's a tool. And for economics and finance, we are more interested in economic insights. It's like determine the economic interpretation of some results sometimes have even higher hurdle. So this is high dimension, okay. So then I want to talk about complex structure. So it's not in traditional row column format. So here's a nice summary. Uh, it's two authors from JP Morgan, they write a manual. And they divided unstructured data into three types. So the first type is generate by individuals. For example, social medias, product reviews, web searches, right? And the second type is generated by business transactions. For example, supermarket scanner data, SEC filings. And the third type is something created by sensors. What are the sensors? Satellite, think about it. Pollution and weather sensors. They also create lots and lots of data. They can help you to ask interesting economic questions. So let me start with the first one, is individuals. Here is the data of Twitter, okay? This is unstructured data. So when we saw this data, there are two challenges. Number one is like how to extract information from this unstructured data. That's a technical problem. Uh, there are two ways. Uh, the first way actually is a su surprisingly simple. It's like find a data vendor. So there are, in JP Morgan's manual, they have 77 pages of lists of alternative data vendors. I mean, you, you would be amazed to look at the, all kinds of data they create. So what do they do? Uh, let me summarize, majority of them do one thing. They transform unstructured data to structured data, to the panel data, which we know. Uh, so if you look at, this is a summary statistic of, of that manual. Uh, this is the frequency of wars. Uh, majority, uh, the buzzword in that field is satellites. And there are lots of firms, you don't need to, I don't know how to analyze satellite data. Uh, these firms are using, many of them using machine learning techniques and they generate structured data for you. Okay, and the second solution is like uh, work with guys from other fields. I have one paper uh, for that. Uh, but then what can we contribute? So here's the question, it's like uh, there are lots of unstructured data. Does that create unique measure of economic activity. We don't know before. So I want to give you one example. It's uh, my paper with Jida, uh, Natish and Shri. Okay. So think about uh, information diffusion is very, very important for economics. So there are lots of like theories and empirical that suggest like word of mouth communication is very, very important for economic activity. But then the question, who document word of mouth communication? Before it's hard, but it's such an important economic question. So there are lots of smart people find proxies for word of mouth communication. For example, you can base on whether we are neighbors, whether we are close to each other, or whether we go to the same school. So usually we assume if you and I go to the same school, we probably know each other, we probably talk more, right? But still, we. These are smart ideas, but still we don't see information diffusion. And recently there are two nice papers, they're interesting criminal investigations. Why it's important? Because if you bring something to a court and they, their documents tells you who tells you what, that's a unique case you can see information diffusion, right? So there are papers about insider trading, there are papers about Ponzi schemes, and then there are legal documents. It's a small sample, but it also provides additional insights. But what is the big data solution? Big data solution is like, think about tweets. You can sort of see information diffusion, right? So here is the motivating example. So let's say a G, my co-author, has 10,000 followers. And he said, Twitter data are unstructured. And then this is my second co-author, Natish. 
And G told the story to Natish, and then more people know. And Natish then retweet that to Jen. Okay, this is information diffusion. And then how to capture that? So this is the tweet data. We first need to figure out the, the ID of the tweet. When it is created, and uh, how many followers the person has, or the news outlet has, and then we can follow one retweet. So if we look at one retweet, we know something. It's like uh, we know the, the tweet was transmitted to one person, and then the other person retweet. Okay, we just follow the same tweet ID, and we also follow how many people follow this retweet guy. So what's the purpose? It's like we want to create an empirical measure of information diffusion. So what is information diffusion? Information diffusion, diffusion basically tells you through time how many people know the information. Okay, a tweet, it's not perfect measure, but at least it tells us based on number of followers, we can construct the speed of uh, information diffusion. For example, this is the fifth percentile, this is the medium, uh, uh, this is 95 percentile. How many people the information reach? So what do we find? Finally we realize, uh, like, there are lots of functions of social media, but we find one function, it's like social media sometimes uh, spread old news. What does that mean? It's like, okay, if you get a tweet, let's say, okay, you get a tweet from one of your friends, some firm is cool, something like that, that's old news. Uh, so we use, uh, so the stare is 10 minutes after the initial release of the news outlet. But retail traders, lots of them, maybe not you, still get excited. And what's the pattern? It's like it creates temporal price pressure. Price move away for a very short period of time, and they revert within next day. So what does that mean? That means, okay, smart trader should trade against the Twitter sentiments. If you see good news, you should sell and then buy it back quickly. So, but here's one thing, it's like, a, Paul Titlock has a nice paper about uh, steer news across traditional news media, and the reversion happens much, much slowly. So then here's an open question. We have a conjunction, we haven't do that. It's like, are these smart traders machines? Because we know lots of machines say, okay, uh, people writing descriptions saying, okay, we try to follow social media. So originally I thought, oh, th these guys trade in the direction of sentiment. They say good news, they should buy, they follow. Finally we realized, since they are machines, they might do the opposite. They trade against sentiment. But then that opens, broader question is, like, number one, do machines trade against human behavioral buyers? After this question, there are two, uh, if the answer is yes, then it's like, if they trade against human behavior bias, do they intentionally do that? Or it's because they follow certain decision rules. They, they, they do that without even knowing they're doing that. And the next question is, uh, are markets more efficient due to the rise of machines? That's the economic interesting question. So let me summarize about structure challenges. So for techniques, uh, uh, you can analyze satellite data by yourself, but I strongly recommend you either find a data vendor or work with experts in other fields. But I hope I can convince you, big data, I mean unstructured data, can create unique measures of economic activity. I just show you one example, but I'm pretty sure there are more. And it helps us uh, to financial economics to test economic theory, okay. Then the next question is like, we talk about how to test the economic theory, but does big data create any new theory? So in the rest of the time, I want to convince you, yes, okay. So it starts with an empirical project. It's like, you guys probably know high frequency trading, Michael Lewis, like flash boy books, this guy's super fast, nanoseconds, microseconds. But then a natural question, why their arms racing speed? So we start with an empirical project. Uh, the, uh, at the beginning, economic intuition is, uh, pretty straightforward, it's like, think about it. majority of models we learn, it's like a variation equilibrium, there's an implicit but important assumption, it is price is continuous. I still remember when I have my PhD quantification exam, it's like I need to solve the price level, and then the price level is square root of two. Do you see that in reality? Probably not, right? That's one reason. Number two is like zero regulations. For example, if you trade in your US stock exchange, you want to list the quotes, there's one set minimum price variation. 
That was imposed by SEC Rule 612. Okay, and uh, then you probably say, okay, how can trade happen? Uh, let me tell you one thing. It's like a, uh, probably when we, you think about trading, it's like there's a market maker, specialist. Most of these guys disappear. So this currently stock market is something called a limit order book, and it's a voluntary liquidity provision. But then you guys say, how can trade happen? Let's say Tony want to buy 100 shares at $100. And then Tony say, okay, this is an empty book. How, how can Tony do that? He said, okay, I become a liquidity provider. So basically Tony said, I list the offer to buy $100. And then Tony is called liquidity provider, okay? And then how can trade happen? So you, uh, Tony needs someone to accept his limit order. So then uh, Mao then arrive, I accept your limit order. And then I see 100 shares at $100. A transaction happens. First guy, limit order, liquidity supplier. Second guy, market order, liquidity demander. But then let's say, I realize our oh, liquidity provider is cool. I also want to provide liquidity. But then you have two guys provide liquidity. There need to be some rule to break the tie. So there are two rules. Uh, the two rules, first one is called price priority. So that means at a given price, if you quote a better price, so you, you become the winner. So in this case, Tony win, because you pose a sale order of lower price. Okay, but let's say, okay, in this case, we quote the same price, and then the second priority come in. It's called a time priority. First come, first serve. So in this case, you also win, okay? So here's the hypothesis. Finally, we think about, oh, why there's an arms race in speed? It's because there are constrained price competition. Okay, but then, I mean, because the uniform tick size means like, okay, that means HFT are more actively provide liquidity for low price stocks. Because once the tick size is, more binding. Okay, but then for empirical project, the first question people always asked in the seminar is identification, identification, and identification, right? It, but people can say, okay, low price stocks are different. So they how can find identification? Okay, finally realize that we, we can find ETFs. Okay, there are two ETFs that track the same index. Sometimes one ETF split and reduce the price. And we can find its twin brother, which is a control group, is the, uh, the ETF does not split. But why it becomes a big data problem, I finally realized because ETF split is rare. So we need to go through like four years of data to find 64 splits and reverse splits. It's tens of terabytes of data because remember, each day is large. You need to search for four years to make, uh, make this mechanism work. It's a big data project. What do we find? So here's the mechanism. So let's say, non-HFT quote a better price than HFT. And there's a split to reduce the price by half. And then hold all other things equal. Non-HFT will move to $50 and 1.5 cents. And HFT will move here. But then tick size can't kick in. And then non-HFT has to quote the same price as HFT. And then they lose time priority. So that's one of the origin of high frequency trading. You probably ask me, where is the theory? In this example, actually, wave hands making one thing. So finally, we published the paper, but there are more, it raised more puzzles. Number one, who are these non-HFTs? Are they humans? Probably not. Number two question is, why they quote better price than HFTs? They must have a reason. Why HFT do not compete more aggressively in price? They are non HFT. So that's the theory part. So we start with analysis of big data, then we have new theory, and then we put a new analysis of big data. Finally, uh, the model is complex, but let me summarize that using one slide. It's like, here's a simple thing. It's like, uh, including me, many researchers in this world think things like black and white. Either you are a computer or you are human. But finally, realize, I mean, there are a third type. It's called half human, half computer. So you guys say, oh, Terminator. <laughs> uh, not Terminator, it's like, finally, we, uh, we include a model with a new type of traders. Actually, they're really, really important. It's called buy-side algorithmic traders. So why call them half machine, half human? Because there are lots of portfolio managers, so they make investment decision. Now they are machine learning investors, but still, lots and lots of funds using human to make investment decision. 
the investment decision. What is the investment decision? Buy one million share of Google. That's the investment decision. But now the market is so complex, they need to use computer algorithms to execute orders for portfolio manager. And uh, what's the decision for the algorithm? It's like whether you demand liquidity or whether you supply liquidity. What's the purpose? Minimize transaction cost, right? So these traders, bats are faster than humans, but they are slower than HFTs. You guys probably ask me why. Uh, because they don't need to. The traders need. It's not like HFT. HFT need to like, uh, consistently monitor market to find any opportunity. So let's start with a benchmark. There's a nice paper by Bullish, Crampton, and Shane. Uh, it was presented in AFA, AEA joint launching keynote last year. Very nice model. So it's a continuous time, continuous price model with two types of traders. Again, it's two. So who are these two types? HFTs. HFTs, what does HFT do? HFT just consistently monitors the market to find any uh, pricing or uh, profit opportunity. They demand or supply liquidity when never there is a profit opportunity. So in their model, non-HFTs has an in elasticity demand to buy or sell, one unit. And their arrival intensity is lambda i. And uh, they only demand liquidity, okay, in their model. So there's a security with value called VT. So the value evolves as a compound person process. It's public information, everybody knows that. Uh, in, but it can jump with intensity lambda j, and with equal probability, it would jump up or jump down. Let's say the size is d. So, Let's first look at uh, their model. I will summarize their model, I mean, in two slides. Uh, so let's say, here's HFT. HFT sale at the ask. Suppose a non-HFT arrive. That's good news for this HFT. Because the HFT will make half the bid-ask spread. That's good news. That's a revenue of HFT. But what is the cost? The cost is the value can jump. There's one HFT sale at the ask. But remember, there are other HFTs. And other HFT will become snipers. What do they do? They look at, oh, there is a stair quote here. Why not snipe that? And if this guy, this guy can escape, but with certain probability, this guy gets sniped. And liquidity providers lose money. Snipers make money. So the main takeaway from a bullish Kremlin and Shane is like, even if it's public information, because of this sniping risk, the bid ask spread is not zero. Okay. Then let's suppose we just add, first add one layer to bullish Crampton and Shane model. We split the trader. So now we introduce half machine, half human here. They are bats. So first let, look at the original strategy. In bullish Crampton and Shane, they only demand liquidity. So then they pay half the spread, which is S star divided by two. If you are smart enough, will you do that? I want to show you, no, you never do that if price is continuous. Why? Because there's an easy strategy, simply beats the previous strategy. It's like, okay, suppose I'm a bat. I can pose a limit order here at VT plus epsilon. What will happen? Because I, I mentioned to you is like a VT is public information, so fundamental value is here. So all these HFTs look at, oh, there's a profit opportunity here, which is epsilon. And what will these HFTs do? They will immediately they, they come to demand liquidity at a microsecond or nanoseconds. There's a profit. And the transaction cost for the bat is plus epsilon. It's much smaller than half the spread. Okay, so what's the takeaway? The takeaway is like, this is a model of machine intact with another machine. A faster guy intact with a faster guy. So then the strategy becomes very interesting. Number one is like, you may ask, why bats on the condition news benchmark always provide liquidity? There's an important word, opportunity cost. Bats have lower opportunity cost of providing liquidity because they have to buy or sell. So that's the reason. Whenever there's a price competition, they can do that. Okay, because they have different outside option or opportunity cost, but then what, Think about HFT strategy. HFT strategy have one economic intuition. It's like HFT has two prices. One is price they offer. I list the offer, there's a price. And there's another price I accept if I'm HFT. What's the difference? It's like when you list the offer, it's subject to sniping risk. 
So if you sell, you want to sell at a higher price, but you are going to accept a price which is lower. So that's a, uh, that's the reason, okay, what I showed in the previous slide. But what's the main takeaway is like, machine and machine interaction are fascinating because it blurs lots of traditional definition. For example, in the previous example, I show you, based on traditional definition, uh, like limit order, in limit order book literature, the first guy is bad. Bad arrive first, so bad becomes liquidity provider. But bad will generate immediate response from HFTs. So then the question is like, uh, who provides liquidity becomes an open question, right? So it's because it's machine and machine interaction. So, so then we generate lots of predictions and policy implications. I will not go into details, but the original purpose uh, by this paper with Xing Wang and Sada Li is like, uh, we want to explain why non HRT quote beta price. Okay. The reason is opportunity cost. But finally realize, so we, we write a model, it generates lots of new predictions, especially when we add in discrete price, which is another layer. So there are four types of equilibrium, and it works extremely well in predicting who provides liquidity and when. On a different condition, sometimes HIT provides liquidity, sometimes BATS provide liquidity. So what's the takeaway from that? The takeaway from that is like, I believe machine and machine interaction probably provide one of the most, one of the best environment to develop economic theory because they follow some decision rules because everything is coded in. If you find the economic mechanism of their behavior, you will make great predictions because they are, uh, I don't think they're less subject to sentiments or kinds of variables they don't know, which is not in the code. And it also has policy implications. For example, SEC recently have a tick size pilot program. They increase the tick size, which is a really a good natural experiment if you work in corporate finance. It's like uh, they randomly pick 1,200 stocks and increase the tick size from one cent to five cents. Okay, so implication for the model, it's consistent with the queuing, more, a queuing equilibrium in our model. It's like, I predict this policy initiative can potentially increase the number of HFTs. So later, so I want to talk about the financial ecosystem. So, so when I was a student, uh, I work with 13F data. So what is a short-term trader in 13F data? Uh, there are some papers say uh, a trader with horizon below four months is. Why? Because the, uh, it's for e each quarter you get one observation. You, you, you do not know what happened below a quarter. And there's a reason the proliferation of literature starting the other end is microseconds and nanoseconds. Okay, it's high frequency trading literature. But there's underexplored territory. It's, are there any guys in between? I'm pretty sure yes, the answer is yes. At least I show you two examples. First one is BATS. BATS is slightly slower than HFT. They live in executing horizon. BATS, let's say, are milliseconds, seconds. And machine learning guys, they are even slower. It's like their horizon is anywhere from a few minutes to a few months. But then we m meet a very big challenge because U.S. data usually the best. Uh, U.S. data usually you don't see traders' identity at this, this horizon, right? So then it's uh, it's uh, we almost have no data. So then uh, this is uh, a working progress. Is uh, Alex Chingo and I? It's like uh, we try to solve this problem using public available data. We know that there are guys living different horizon. Horizon may be one way to differentiate traders. So at least the trading volume data is available. Tech data, the small data set I just mentioned to you, but it's really big. So let's do one thing. We f first aggregate the trading volume at a minute by minute horizon, okay? So each minute we go get our observation and then we can measure the variance of one minute horizon, right? And then we use wavelet estimator. What do we do is like we decompose each stock trading volume variance into time scale specific components using wavelet estimator. So what's the main idea? I just show you the main idea. So let's look at an A period example, the mean the series. So it's like first period is zero volume, here is 100, here is minus 100, okay? So you can have a graph representation here. So then in A period example, uh, it's straightforward. What happens in different horizon? 
So in A period, we have low frequency, medium frequency, and high frequency in this simple example. So low frequency variation is compare the variance of the, the change in the first half and the second half. Let's call that a low frequency, okay? In reality, maybe it's the uh, first two weeks, two second two weeks, okay? And the medium frequency, there's one to two minutes compared to three to four minutes. There's another, uh, another wavelength here, okay? And high frequency is minute by minute variation, okay? I will not go to, into details, but I, I provide you with two examples. Look at here. So in this time series, all the variation comes from the difference between the first half and the second half. So this one we call is a low frequency movement. 100% is at a low frequency. Okay, and this is another extreme, is that everything happens at very high frequency. Then we, we say everything is high frequency. So I will not go detail, uh, into details, but here I want to give you one takeaway. It's like, here's my two, the two cents I got through this process. It's like, we start with big data. And then we have theory. And then theory discuss some underexplored territories. And it motivates empirical predictions, it motivates policy implications, and it, sometimes it motivates new empirical tools. Okay, so let me conclude. So I want to make several points. So big data provides lots of challenges, but it also offers us lots of opportunities for new research questions. For techniques, I want to summarize. High performance computing will help us with the size challenge. And Machine learning can help us with the dimension challenge, right? I mean, alternative data vendors, there are lots of alternative data vendors provide unique data, but sometimes they do not provide the data you exactly want, like information diffusion, and you can work with experts from other fields. Okay. But what is more important is like, I want to, I hope I have already convinced you, it's like big data opens doors for new research questions. So once you have computing power, you can document new empirical regularities, and you can change the conclusion from the previous results based on smaller data set, that's the first thing. Document facts is the first thing. And also, it also motivates us to find economic interpretation of the data, okay? Machine learning, I mean, it's predictive, but we still can find economic intuitions on some cases, okay? And also, it can create unique measures to test the existing theories. Okay, and it also motivates to construct new theories. So, uh, because my, uh, my area is on training, but at least I show you one example. I hope I can um, let you think more. It's like, think about what is this like a big data machine learning is very popular words. But think about that in trading industry. I want to let you think about one thing. Think about behavior finance. It's like, what's the foundation of behavior finance? It's psychology, right? There are lots of things that was derived from psychology. And now it's like 85% of trading volume are coming from machines. It is possible, it's like big data and machine learning will be the foundation for the next generation of theory. I call that algorithmic behavioral finance. Thank you. <laughs>